The most traumatic episode of Walking with Dinosaurs was likely Giant of the Skies, watching that poor old Ornithochirus fail to find love, but at least he got one last road trip in before perishing. It was the first time many people were introduced to the giant, snout-crested Cretaceous pterosaur group called the Ornithochiriformes. Incidentally, the last group of pterosaurs to have teeth. Thanks to the super long and global history of these pterosaurs, new ones keep being described from already known specimens after researchers take the time to compare and contrast the many dozens of specimens in collections from around the world. One such specimen was discovered in Texas in the early 2000s, and it turns out to be a completely unique ornithochiriform that was missing the characteristic snout crest. Let's learn about Atodactylus. The Ornithochiriformes group of pterosaurs is now incredibly large and inclusive. The most familiar faces of this group belong to Anhanguera, Ornithochiris, Tropognathus, and Colaborhynchus. These pterosaurs are easily identified for their inflated snout tips in which the bone arches up and down on the top and bottom of the jaws. The exact shape or extent of these bony crests varies between critters and even between individuals, but that is an immediately obvious trait. They also carried a set of long, skinny teeth that pointed outwards, with the upper jaw teeth bending downwards and the lower jaw teeth bending upwards in such a way that the teeth basically fit together like a fish or bug trap. Many of these critters were small to average size for pterosaurs, with a few reaching quite large sizes. Now, unfortunately, these pterosaurs were some of the first pterosaurs known to science, with the earliest known descriptions published in the 1840s. Over a handful of large pterosaur specimens were being uncovered from the various Cretaceous-aged chalk layers across Europe, mostly England. The paleontological meta at the time was to name any new pterosaur fossils as new species of the pterodactylus genus, even if they contained different traits. After all, almost all of these large specimens were very fragmentary, quite unlike the Jurassic pterosaurs of the Solnhofen sediments. Over time, as with many other extinct animal genera like Megalosaurus, researchers went back to the various species thrown into the genus name and parsed out what could be quantified. This sort of re-evaluation over time has resulted in new genera of animals that are defined by very different traits. Within the last 25 years or so, the organization of these freaky flying archosaurs has begun to be sorted out. With this narrowing of group definitions comes brand new specimens that continue to add new data to the pile, further complicating the relationships between critters, but also adding new data to be more precise with these relationships. Just one of these new data points was a pterosaur specimen found in 2006 eroding out of an outcrop of the Tarant Formation not far from a construction site in Mansfield, southwest of Dallas, Texas, by non-commercial fossil hunter Lance Hall. Yes, that's right, after looking at his still updating website, he seems like one of the rare folks who just finds fossils cause they're neat. Much respect, maybe someday I can reach the honorable spot among his favorite YouTube channels. Hall's specimen was simply a 15-inch, 38-centimeter long lower jaw. Thankfully, most of the lower jaw, but still, just a jaw. Once appropriately field prepared and jacketed, Hall was generous enough to donate his find to his closest museum, which was the Schuller Museum of Paleontology at the Southern Methodist University. Its donation allowed the specimen to be ascensioned as SMU 76383. Here is that specimen. Since it's just a lower jaw, why don't I take a closer look at the specific anatomy preserved? Pterosaurs are weird all over their bodies. It kinda happens when a group of animals evolves to fly. This is way more obvious in their proportions, fusion of certain skeletal elements, hollow bones, and air sac systems, but it's also obvious in a part of their body as pedestrian as their jaw. The Texas jaw is a perfect example to use. To have a sturdier jaw that could resist the forces of prey, wind, and other natural phenomena, pterosaurs adapted their jaw into one single fused element. 
In some animals, but pterosaurs and birds especially, the lower jaw is called a mandible as the two halves are fused together at the tip. This fusion is called a symphysis. Many pterosaurs and birds take this adaptation to different extremes. For example, many pterosaur jaws are mostly symphysis for the length of the jaw, with the splitting or opening of the jaw being restricted to the back of the head. In such bizarre pterosaurs, this could likely indicate their mouth tissues were also restricted to the back of the mouth. You could almost make the analogy to the mouths of crocodiles today, in that they have their jaw tissues, like the tongue and flesh that covers the jawbone, stuck to the open space of the jaw near the back. This was not quite the case here in the Texas jaw, for, as you can see, the fused part ends just a tiny bit before halfway along the jaw. The symphysis part of this jaw is very skinny, and the entire mandible is quite flat from top to bottom. Only a few teeth are preserved, with much of the jaw just preserving the many tooth sockets, which would have amounted to 27 pairs. The two remaining teeth were flattened from side to side, anatomically referred to as laterally compressed and slightly curved backwards. Thanks to the size of the teeth, when they are missing, they make the jaw look incredibly strange, like a ridged or spiny jigsaw blade. Another interesting feature is a set of holes that go with the set of tooth sockets. It's hypothesized these holes were where the teeth of the upper jaw slid into when the jaws were fully closed. These holes disappear from the jaw about halfway from the tip, which may mean the teeth of the upper jaw become smaller and shorter towards the back. It was paleontologist Timothy Myers who sought to publish this specimen after hearing about it from researcher Louis Jacobs, finally getting it described in 2010 with a paper in the Journal of Vertebrate Paleontology. After quantifying all the anatomical traits of the jaw, Myers was confident he had a new animal on his hands and named it Atodactylus holi, from the Greek atos for eagle, dactylos for finger, and the species name in honor of Lance Hall. Now that there is a name to attach to this beast, what did it look like and how can something as simple and fragmentary as a jaw be used to name a whole new animal? Like for real, how is this not just ornithochiriform indeterminate? Well, don't get ahead of yourself, my little edgelings. I gotta tackle the first question. Though perhaps some parts of the second question will be answered by answering the first. So as I went over a few minutes ago, the jaw is quite slim fit, flattened from top to bottom, anatomically referred to as dorsoventrally compressed. It's also very skinny. A lot of the minutia in the anatomy preserved in various semi-fused and fused bones of this jaw pointed to Myers that this animal was an ornithochiriform. The huge group of crest-jawed, super-toothy pterosaurs most common in the early Cretaceous of South America, Europe, Africa, and Australia. Spit fact real quick, Atodactylus is actually only the second report of this type of pterosaur from North America. Anyways, Atodactylus is quite unlike many other ornithochiriforms in lacking a bony crest on the lower jaw. Using the length of the jaws, combined with the tooth orientation and size predicted by the sockets that once held them, this is a good approximation of what its head may have looked like. Now, since the full skull was not recovered, it's possible Atodactylus had a crest on the snout. There are distant relatives like Hemipterus, which had only one crest on top of the snout. However, considering it's related to mostly crestless animals, Occam's razor would infer Atodactylus was also completely crestless. The rest of Atodactylus has to be inferred from its closest relatives. Thankfully, much of the ornithochiriform tree retained similar bodily proportions. Small torso, huge shoulders, super long arms, short legs, a short tail, a medium length neck, and a big ol' head. Many are thought to have been coastal soarers due to their huge humerus and forearm in comparison to their short hind limbs. They wouldn't have been as great at moving around on the ground as pterosaurs like the ashdarkoids or pterodactyloids. In the original description paper, Myers compared it to many other members of the Ornithochiriformes, finding it to be most similar to the Chinese Boreopteris and leaving Atodactylus as a floating member of the Ornithochiridae family. Over the 15 years since this publication, a bunch more crestless Ornithochiriforms have been found, with a few interestingly coming out of Australia. For some real quick backstory context, ornithochirid fossils had been discovered in Australia for decades, with many of them being referred to the wastebasket genus Ornithochiris, or just simply left as Ornithochiridae indeterminate. 
Fast forward to the 2010s and you have a few researchers finding the Australian material to be too distinct from the European and South American ornithochiroid fossils to retain their generic labels. So, in 2019, more researchers redescribed some fragmentary Australian jaw remains as new genera, specifically Targaryen Draco and its closest relatives within the newly erected Targaryen Draconidae and Targaryen Draconia. This chunky study also found that the previously known Simoleopteridae family of crestless pterosaurs belonged to the Targaryen Draconia. With all this work, Atodactylus finally found a place that makes sense among the Simoleopterids as part of the Targaryen Draconia, an entire clade of crestless, thin-snouted ornithochiriform spin-offs. With that, the rest of Atodactylus can now be more confidently reconstructed, and it's not much different than generic ornithochirid, though at a much smaller size. Speaking of which, why don't I bring in Mr. Man from Animal Planets the Most Extreme. To show you just how small, I relate to you before the 15 centimeter length of the snout. This could mean the critter was young when it died, but since many of the crestless ornithochiriforms are also relatively small, Atodactylus may have just been a small little guy as well. Based on the proportions of its relatives, plus some rough maths, some paleoartists and researchers have estimated the beastie at about 1.15 meters or 3.7 feet in length from snout tip to tail tip. The people at Teros have Atodactylus with a wingspan of 3 meters or 10 feet, but there's no reference for such a figure. I found that a Nat Geo article that came out with the paper stated the authors estimated the animal may have had a wingspan of 9 feet 3 meters, so I guess that's where the figure comes from? Thanks, Mr. Man. Now that you have an idea of the backstory of this interesting critter and how it fits into the pterosaur tree, what kind of world was it living in? The skimpy remains of Atodactylus were pulled from the calcareous sandstone of the Tarant Formation at a site near Job Pool Lake in northeastern Texas. The Tarant Formation has been dated, with the help of ammonite biostratigraphy, to the Cenomenian stage of the Late Cretaceous. That's the very beginning of the Late Cretaceous Epoch, around 97 million years ago. The rock types in which the fossils were preserved were a marine calcareous sandstone with a bunch of mud-sized particles throughout. This means the animal's final resting place was possibly relatively close to shore, since the further out to sea you go, the smaller the particles of sediment tend to get, with plenty of exceptions, of course. At the same site that revealed Atodactylus, fish vertebrae and teeth were found. Other scraps of bone without a good identification were also found. Other fossil collectors have found the jaws of Pachyrhizodus, shark bits, and vertebrae from the marine lizard Coniosaurus. The Tarant Formation itself is a small section among the very large Eagle Ford Group, a group of marine formations that go from shallower sediments to deeper ones. Above the Tarant Formation is the Britain Formation, and then the Arcadia Park Formation. The huge bed of the Eagle Ford Group documents much of the extent of the Western Interior Seaway, the shallow inland sea that rudely parted the eastern and western halves of North America from Mexico to Alaska. At the time Atodactylus was snapping for fish in the warm tropical waters of the inland sea, the world's oceans, and particularly the Western Interior Seaway, started to feel the burden of something called an oceanic anoxic event. This event occurs when oceans become deprived of dissolved oxygen. This can happen for a multitude of reasons and perhaps many reasons at once, and they have occurred many times throughout Earth's history. Most of them correspond with global mass extinctions. But the one which occurred from the Cenomanian to the Turonian was unique in that it occurred in small pockets across the world and did not cause huge mass die-offs of animal groups. Large amounts of volcanic activity were going down during this time, and many researchers think this may have been a leading factor, increasing temps in different sulfuric chemical soups to suffocate relatively small animal communities. This event has been the explanation used to explain a relatively paltry number of bottom-feeding fossils from the layers of the Eagle Ford group. When Atodactylus was alive, it was probably more than capable of snagging slippery prey with its basket of hooks without worrying too much about toxic waters. Swimming above the nastiest layers of these toxic areas were likely all sorts of plesiosaurs, both long and short-necked forms. Interestingly, this was just a little too early for the truly giant mosasaurs. 
Instead, Dalek Asaurids and really weird offshoots like the flat-bodied Mesoleptos were swishing around. There were some early forms of true Mosasaurs, but none were like the giant Leviathans that patrolled the seas of the latest Cretaceous. Aside from these critters, there were the ever-present turtles, us an assortment of yet-to-be-found seabirds. Based on fauna from the same time but up north in the western continent of Laramidia, the closest spot of land to Atodactylus may have featured very early Tyrannosaurs, early Hadrosaurs, Notosaurs, Therizinosaurs, Ovaraptorosaurs, primitive Ceratopsians, and pretty much everything left over from the early Cretaceous, aside from the Brachiosaur-type sauropods and the Allosauroids that butchered them. Perhaps a much more interesting world than the simple yet funny looking jaw of a fish fetching pterosaur would suggest. For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, like this video, drop a comment in the comment section below, and hit the bell icon to stay in the know with everything Edge. Thanks for watching.